It's tabletop time. I'm Jen. And I'm Dave. And it's not my birthday. Jen was just doing a reenactment of what happened a few months ago at the studio. Yes. So a couple of friends and I pitched in to get this for Dave for his birthday. And I think you're thoroughly surprised on our awesome gift for you. So this is a Forge World Legion Blade, which is a super heavy tank. And in today's video, not only am I going to be building and painting a Horus Heresy Alpha Legion Glaive, but I'm also going to be exploring the history of super heavy tanks throughout Games Workshop's legacy. I couldn't, I couldn't just get you a birthday present and you could just paint it like you. Everything is content! My Dave, that's a nice looking tank you have there. Wait, that doesn't look like a tank, that's a box. Yes, Forge Wood boxes are rather uninspiring, but inside there is overpriced resin. And I do note, despite cleaning it, that there is still crap all over the vlog camera lens. So the first thing I did as I looked into my beautiful Legion Glaive is make sure I had all the parts. And to do that, I thought I would use the power of editing rather than bothering to check myself. Ah, nice. Everything seems to be there. What about that bit? Uh, no, that bit isn't there. Okay, let's fix that. Now, I can't go any further without saying a big thank you to you guys. Thanks, Jen and Murray <gasps> ah, and my ah. other friends. You all got together and actually bought me this kit for my birthday this year, which was super lovely. And we filmed that process of you giving me the gift. I had no idea what yep. it was going to be. And that actually became a Patreon exclusive video. And if you're interested in getting that kind of behind the scenes content, extra content, or being part of our mini reviews, it would mean the world to us if you could go on down and consider supporting our Patreon. Join our exclusive mini club discord and get access to silliness like that. We're also working on building a outtakes and bloopers reel and we're planning on updating them periodically once those videos get long enough. All the gold we had to leave on the cutting room floor. Murray, it's time I reveal to everyone a terrible, terrible secret. Is it your wig? <laughs> No, we're not talking about the wig. I told you about the wig, don't fucking talk about this. A beautiful bath is necessary as they don't do this beforehand and there's often release agent left caked on resin models. Not just Forge World, all resin models often have this issue. And you wanna go at it with some warm soapy water and a scrubbing brush to make sure that is all gone because paint will not stick to it, not even primer. Oh, you wash your hands at the same time, nice. It was the first and only time I've done it this month, so it was worth doing. I've noticed this is some plastic parts in your kit. Yeah, this is part of the Bane Blade Super Heavy Tank plastic kit because one of the big problems with Forge World resin kits, especially large ones, is keeping a uniform shape as all the panels warp in some capacity. So being able to effectively clad the plastic frame really helps this kit assemble well. Oh man, if they only did this for the Stormbird. <laughs> now with that said, this is an expensive lump of Forge World resin, so that means lots of bent parts, shaping and moving things. This piece here, I actually heated up in some hot water so I could get it into shape because the instructions tell you to to fit it after you have glued the sides together, which of course is literally impossible as the tags need to go into the left and right pieces of plastic. So I got some very hot water, bent it in so I could basically make it a floppy bit of spaghetti, put it in the position and then uh, flatten it out again. All right, that one seems like a bit of an oversight. Come on, Mari, what do you expect? It's a $500 model. What do you think it's just gonna fit together? Yeah, I can't ask too much of that. Now, I will say here was part of my model building process that I was super, super disappointed in. Uh, both sides of my tank were actually broken straight out of the box. And honestly, this is pretty unforgivable in my opinion. Like this is a nice flat armored panel seam on a space spring tank and you will never get that resin to glue perfectly flat again. Really, this is some pretty poor quality control. And while I hear people already shouting, but Forge World has excellent customer service, you could call them and they'll probably send you replacement parts. They may well do that but this was first of all a gift so I don't have proof of purchase necessarily but second of all I'm filming on a production timeline so really I've got no choice but to just forge ahead try and glue this together sand it off putty it up and just improve it as best I can I'll paint it as battle damage later all right it's a little hobby hack I made sure to take the gun that goes in the turret out before finishing gluing it together and spraying both the back of the gun and also the inside of that recess where the gun will sit it's a really good way to make sure that at worst if there's areas your paintbrush can't 
can't reach, it will at least be really dark and shadowy. Gap filling is something that A, I'm not very good at, and B, I don't have the patience for. But for some of the most heinous gaps on this model, I did attempt a little bit of gap filling and then sanded it back when it was dry. Yeah, mush that noodle. <gasps> That's what she said. Giant tanks. Long have they been awe-inspiring to many an enthusiastic 13-year-old starting out the hobby. And Games Workshop have always had a plethora of these huge war machines to enjoy. However, right at the beginning, the difficulties with casting and size and the relative small size of Games Workshop and its status as a niche games company meant that producing the colossal behemoths depicted in the artwork was all but impossible. However, with the release of Epic Space Marine in 1989, there was a new avenue to explore these gigantic scaled conflicts in the settings of Warhammer. It was in that year of 89 that the first post-release of rumblings of new kits for Epic started to happen, showcasing Imperial Super Heavy Tanks. And the very first Super Heavy Tank to ever get rules, a name, and a model was the Glaive. But for those keeping score, notably, this tank has the very same appearance and war gear as a very different tank we'd be familiar with. But notably, the Glaive of this era is visually and statistically identical to what would go on to be known as the Baneblade. From what I can gather at this stage, the tank was not available for purchase. They were showing off some pre-promotional images and paint jobs in their White Dwarf articles to build up hype for the release. And it wasn't alone. It also came along with the Falchion, which was a tank destroyer variant of the Glaive. Three issues after its original reveal in White Dwarf 123, the Falchion and Glaive would see their official release, alongside a bit of a rebalance. And quietly, almost not mentioned in this rebalance was one subtle thing a name change. The Imperial Guard was now being released and it was being rebranded as an Imperial Super Heavy Tank. So it was official, and for the first time ever, people could own their very own Super Heavy Tanks from the Warhammer universe. The now renamed Baneblade and Shadow Sword were here, and the names Glaive and Falchion would fade away into obscurity for the next few decades. Now I'm painting this tank Emperor's Children, can't you see everyone? I am not a huge fan of painting my models using color shift paints or effects like that, and the Horus Heresy Alpha Legion are painted in a kind of metallic turquoise or a color shift effect. I find that all the armies painted like that generally look fairly similar and you don't have room to A, stand out, but B, do some different painting techniques because once that color shift is applied, you basically can't muck up and you also can't highlight it or do anything really interesting to it. It's a great look, but it's not the look for me. I manually color shift by way of a gradient all the way up to that nice Araman blue towards the top, creating this beautiful purple all the way through to teal gradient. Yeah, it's really gorgeous. I adore or this gradient that you've made. And with that done, I could move on to detailing. I started out in the brass areas where I used Vallegos. <laughs> Vajayos. Charred brown to bring that up with a dwarf flesh all the way to a nice highlight, making this really cool metallic bronze effect. Working through all the different areas of the brown, I made sure to highlight up to very precise white spot highlights to give that real pang of metallic sheen. And it's really in those final stages of black lining and contrast highlights that you get the non-metallic metal look to pop. As an homage to 40k Alpha Legion, I like to make sure all the trim-like areas on my Heresy Alphas are silver, and to do that, I also do non-metallic metal, starting with Valhishor and their cold gray and stonewall gray, mixing in a little bit of brown and then leading up towards white and down towards that brownie black. Overall, your non-metallic metals look so good on this tank, especially with the gradient with the airbrush. Thank you. There's a lot of nice large areas, and I could use the natural light in the room to actually help me know where that light would be hitting. All right, time for more history. You by now should know I, I love talking about the history of Warhammer. And I guess you love listening to it if your previous clicking on our videos has given me anything to go by. Warhammer Epic was one thing, but super heavy tanks would make their impact in Warhammer 40K in more profound ways. The love of giant tanks is pervasive and it didn't take long for a 40K one to emerge. Games Workshop's Tony Cottrell had scratch built a 40K Baneblade from Plasticard and Bits, and it was promised that a full guide would be revealed in the next month's White Dwarf in White Dwarf 123. However, it wasn't until almost nine months later in White Dwarf 131 that we would finally see that article. You can see that much like the Legion Saber Guide I showed in a previous video, this guide offers comprehensive instructions and templates for how to build your own tank from plastic art and spare bits, encouraging advanced hobbyists to create their own beastly tanks from scratch. In universe, we now had our first look at these gigantic behemoths 
in 40k scale. As you can see just how massive these Bane blades would be, at 13.5 meters long, they are a mere meter shorter than a bus. But their height and width is where it gets really crazy. At 6.3 meters tall, that's more than three people standing on top of each other's heads. They pack a huge amount of firepower into these giant lumbering behemoths. And while it's entirely unrealistic for these kind of things to function on a battlefield, who cares? It's 40k, and with them trembling along at the impressive top speed of 25 kilometers an hour, you'll have plenty of time to comprehend your impending doom as it rumbles towards you. All 11 barrels of fury firing. Back to painting the tank, there were a lot of areas that I painted in a charcoal gray. This included all of the track links as well as various pipes on the model just to break up between the silver pipes I'd be painting later. I also painted some panels on the sides of the tank as larger Alpha Legion vehicles tend to be broken up with black panels as well as their teal panels. This same charcoal gray becomes the undercoat for areas that go on to be painted as metallic silver. And in these areas I use Vaille Jaws, Somber Gray and then I go up to a wolf cray on the highlights, mixing in some white for the point highlights in much the same method as I do with the other non-metallic metal areas. These are great quick techniques to give that non-metallic metal shine on your vehicles without going into too much detail. I think this technique is particularly well exemplified on the front lens of this tank here, and I'm really happy with how that bit in particular and the pipe on top of the Volkite gun turned out. So I couldn't resist customizing this just a little bit to make it my own. Now I've got awesome trans transfers with the XX 20th logo. I've also got really good transfers with the Alpha and Omega, but what I don't have is a company symbol. And this tank is actually part of my beta company. So I grabbed a Roman numeral beta and put that into Blender, making myself a little rhino door with the unbroken chain symbology of the Legion, and then printed that out and fit it in the side of the vehicle. With all the non-metallic metals done, it was time for me to do that plasma glow effect. And I'd already experimented a whole bunch on the small saber tank I've painted previously on the channel. I followed Little Plastic People's Volkite Glow, but just substituted the greens and teals in his tutorial with my reds and oranges. Masking off areas I didn't think the light would immediately fall, I painted the coils white and then airbrushed in contrast paints. I built up to deep reds before spraying white again back into those recesses where I then grabbed a yellow contrast paint and sprayed over the top. This made an instant orange to yellow gradient, which was really nice. Then the final steps of course are to grab some white, apply it back into the tiniest bits of recesses. And then as a final step, you paint on increasingly dark colors, just the top of the coils and then finish with a dead white spot highlight. This seems really contradictory and weird while you're painting it, but when it's done, it really shows off that hot pop of the coils. I love this flaming hot cheaters gun. It's great. It loves you. With a beginning that would leave its mark on Games Workshop history forever, how did the Glaive go from its first iteration in White Dwarf in 1989 to the model I'm working on today? Well, that story starts with the official releases of these models. Scratch building was one thing, but the first official release of a super heavy tank in the 40K setting came when Games Workshop partnered with Armorcast in the early 90s. While they weren't produced by Games Workshop directly, Armorcast models were considered official and legal to use in Games Workshop games. It was sometime between 1991 and 1992 that the Armorcast Baneblade was released. It was actually cast off the original creation by Tony Cottrell. It's really hard to find an exact date when looking back at these times as really there aren't many records that have survived the test of time. Either way, Armorcast's chunky resin kit was the first time anyone who wasn't a master of plastic card scratch building could get their hands on a Baneblade for games of 40k. And it would dominate the battlefields until Games Workshop created their own specialist model branch, Forge World, in 1998. But such an iconic model as the Baneblade did not have to wait long for an official release. It was a year later in 1999 that Baneblade was released by Forge World. And it was this iteration of the tank that would go on to be the one that everyone remembers forever. The kit received full and updated rules for Warhammer 40K in Imperial Armor, which followed in the year 2000, and also was followed up shortly after by the Shadow Sword kit. These kits were mainstays of Forge World's tank range and their Imperial Armor range, and would only be replaced in 2007 when Games Workshop released Warhammer Apocalypse and it came 
came alongside the plastic Bane Blade kit. This multi-part kit could actually build all the variants of the Bane Blade and is still the kit that is in production and in use today. And it's there that the story of Super Heavies could end if it wasn't for 2012. In 2012, Games Workshop decided to explore their immensely popular novel series, Horus Heresy, and make a miniatures game from it. Headed by the visionary mind of the late Alan Bly, Heresy would see the histories of the Warhammer Space Marine Legions explored in depth for the first time and playable on the battlefield. And it was in that year of 2012 that Space Marines received their first ever exclusive super heavy tank, the Foulblade. Following the designer's trend of searching through the earliest histories of Games Workshop for references to create their heresy source material, it was time for the Glaive and the Falchion names to resurface. All right, Dave, so you're on to probably the most laborious part of painting big tank, which is panel line highlighting. Yeah, and I make it even more annoying for myself because what I like to do is anywhere where the gradient has fallen all the way into those purple tones, I actually use Araman Blue, which is the airbrush I finish the tank off with. But anywhere that is in the turquoise or Araman Blue areas, I bring it all the way up to Temple Guard Blue. So not only do I line highlight all the panels, but I also make sure I mix that line highlight down the middle. Yeah, I think it looks pretty good though. It adds a little bit of pop. It's not only line highlighting, but also black lining that I do at this stage. And this just helps all the non-metallic metal areas pop and separate off each other. Transfer time, transfer time. One of the great things about a model at this scale is you have lots of big areas to put some of those nice juicy transfers on these transfer sheets on. So I grabbed a very clean and crisp Alpha Legion logo, one for this big turret, as well as a couple of hydras for down on the main body of the tank. And then the last step is of course, weathering and chipping. So I came in with some black paint, made some bullet marks, and then highlighted the lower side of these to give them the illusion of depth. Once this was done, I used some dark earth weathering pigments and covered them all over the tracks and lower parts of the tank. This really helps cake the tracks in mud and dirt, makes them look a little bit more gritty and brings everything together. Nice, I like how you're doing a little directional skiff with the marks as well, like it's bounced off the round of the turret. It is a very curvy turret, so I thought a couple of skidding bullets would be really good. Chips, cracks and powders done. It's time to take a look at this big tank. Now we've already plugged our patron in this video, but we will say thank you to all our patrons for your support. It really means a lot to us and helps us get these videos done. But you've all heard enough about patrons, but what you haven't done is basked in the glory of my tank. So, um, yeah. Mm. Oh. Wow. I like that. What a big tomb. Oh, I love the gun. Oh, 730 points. Makes me want a bag of Cheetos. That's because I'm putting two Havoc launchers on it. I want to see the baby. Oh, there it is. It's so small. Ah. Thank you for joining me on this journey. And if you've just watched the incredibly cleverly shot reveals, you might not have noticed that I didn't actually get the weathering powders on it yet. I ran out of weathering powders. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Well, if you all enjoyed it as well, you've shown that you've liked these lore videos, so we'd love to see what other ideas you might have. We have a couple of other lore videos for you to check out, so if you're interested in those, you can see those in the boxes up above. Find out the story of the Sabre tank, or perhaps Warhammer Epic. But you know what, guys? I just want to say, thanks for being here. Oh, we finally did a pun without finally. it feeling awful. Finally, finally.